In this lecture series, we will uh, move away from glomerular damage and take a look at other parts of the kidney in which uh, pathology is uh, relevant. Now, the first thing that you want to do here is, well, anatomically locate yourself, and this would be too below interstitial disease. So this is not dealing with the glomerulus. This is dealing with the tubules. But keep in mind, though, oftentimes in order for you to cause damage to the tubule, you'll have to pass through the glomerulus. We call this acute kidney injury, a.k.i. acute kidney injury. Keep this separate from RPGN that we talked about. And later on at some point when we get into chronic renal failure, well, we will then highlight as to what becomes important there. So what kind of issues do you want to keep in mind where the kidney all of a sudden got hurt in an acute nature? And by acute, what does that actually mean in, the, in reference to its timeline? Clinical pathologic process of acute renal failure, some of you have heard of it as such, presenting is oliguria. And you must know that oliguria refers to less than 400 milliliters of urine being produced in a day. And one of the most common causes of acute kidney injury would therefore be Acute tubular necrosis. Now, necrosis to you should mean that the particular tissue is not receiving oxygen. So, therefore, one of the most common causes of acute tubular necrosis, in fact, will be ischemia. We'll take a look at ischemic ATN, nephrotoxicity, uh, meaning to say that endogenously there are certain substances that are being released, maybe due to crush injury. And so, therefore, releasing myoglobin resulting in damage to the kidney in an acute nature. Hemoglobin, here you might be thinking about what's known as intravascular hemolysis, for example, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, in which upon destruction of the RBC within the vasculature is then going to release the hemoglobin, and this hemoglobin, as it passes through and filters through the glomerulus, may then cause damage and cause, result in acute kidney injury. Light chains, here you're thinking about mono, monoclonal gammopathies, including your, well, multimyeloma and company, in which kappa and lambda chains may then cause not only damage to the glomerulus, but may also cause damage to the tubules. And then bilirubin. And remember that you should normally have urobilinogen in your kidney to, so that you can give it that uh, beautiful golden yellow color of a urine that you're also familiar with. Or you might then have conjugated bilirubin, uh, maybe due to hepatitis, we talked about that in hepatobiliary. Or exogenous type of damage that's taking place to the kidney, resulting in acute kidney injury. Aminoglycoside, the antibiotics, are notorious for uh, always making sure that the renal function is, is normal prior to administration. Heavy metals, lead poisoning, resulting in lead nephropathy. Sepsis, always worried about renal failure. Other causes, including volume depletion, urinary obstruction, RPGN, and perhaps even acute interstitial nephritis, AIN. But of all of the etiologies here of acute kidney injury, ischemic would be the most common. Now, acute kidney injury. What are you looking for? Well, we'll go through different phases here. Remember, this is acute, which means that the patient, if all goes well and is receiving proper treatment, should be able to recover the kidneys. You hear what I just said? So this is not chronic renal failure. Failure, Chronic renal failure, though at the point of no return, and for the most part, that patient, it's just inevitable that he or she is going to then be placed on dialysis, correct? But then here, if it's acute, we'll go through different phases when the time is right, in which at first, it very much behaves like a dead kidney. Then we'll go through maintenance phase, and we'll, we'll call something, we'll call a phase in which... Uh, uh, regeneration is taking place as being uh, recovery. At first, you'll have hypertension, just like you would with chronic renal failure. What does that mean? This means that you're not able to properly filter your plasma, and so therefore you are then holding on to fluid. So your extracellular volume increases, and maybe even perhaps angiotensin II may play a role in which your patient with acute kidney injury early on is going to present with hypertension. Next, in addition, Acute kidney injury in the early phase, you're not able to properly filter, so therefore you are in a state of volume overload, excess water and NACL accumulating in your interstitium, edema. 
Uh, just like in chronic renal failure, which is a very common cause of hyperkalemia, you're also going to find this early on. And what you're worried about with hyperkalemia is the fact that the heart might be affected, right? So I mean to say that now your resting member potential is actually moving positive. It's becoming less negative, getting closer to threshold. Be careful. The pH here is the fact that now you're not able to properly hold on to the bicarb, so therefore metabolic acidosis, or not able to properly produce your ammonia, which, is ta which takes place at the proximal cavity tubule. And these are some of the common places. Think about your PCT. Extremely metabolic active. Remember that discussion? So lots of sodium potassium pump activity, a lot of ATP. And so therefore, if one of the common causes of acute kidney injury, in fact, is ischemia, then you, know, you can only imagine that you're not able to properly reabsorb the bicarb. And so therefore, very much behaves like a RTA type 2. However, here it's different because you're also creating a type of metabolic acidosis that would, in fact, be an anion gap. And it's because of organic acids. So you want to be careful. Remember that RTA type 2 is a metabolic acidosis, but that is absolutely non-anion gap, referring to, well, there's no gap in anions with RTAs. Here, however, there will be because of increased organic acid. That's important. What about erythropoietin? Well, just like chronic renal failure, take a look at this table. This table kind of looks like what you'd expect to find in chronic renal failure. Please be really careful. I mean, to say that if you know that your patient is suffering from ischemia, and you know it's a uh, acute kidney injury, early on, it could look like chronic renal failure. Here, the poitin is not present because of kidney damage, so therefore, you would expect your bone marrow to not function properly. Look for a type of normocytic, non-hemolytic type of anemia. Erythroblast, decreased stimulation. Continuing our discussion, along with uh, acute kidney injury, you will also have bone issues. We'll talk more about this, a chronic renal failure. You might have uh, problems where you're not able to properly uh, reabsorb calcium. So you have hypocalcemia. It may result in what's called as uh, secondary hypoparathyroidism, and therefore resulting in renal osteodystrophy, but also at the fact that maybe the PTH cannot properly work on your kidney, and so therefore may result in uh, renal osteodystrophy. The phosphate will not be able to get rid of. You have hyperphosphatemia. The PTH, as I just said here, because you're not able to properly reabsorb the calcium, result in secondary hyperparathyroidism. And calcitriol, well, it's not present because uh, if the PCT has been destroyed early on, then you have decreased uh, conversion because of decreased 1-alpha-hydroxase activity, resulting in osteomalacia type. As far as the calcium is concerned, it'll be hypocalcemic. And the reason for that, as we said earlier, is because there is going to be decreased production of calcitriol or maybe perhaps decreased functioning of your PTH. Now, this is acute, acute. Management is directed towards correcting fluid overload, the hyperkalemia, and signs of uremia. So, uh, at first, everything that you're doing here is very much paying attention to that table, and the objective is to make sure that you take care of that hypertension, hyperkalemia, and those signs that we saw earlier, Uremia, referring to your signs. Okay, so this would then be your hypocalcemia, secondary hyperparathyroidism, hyperphosphatemia, the anemia, the metabolic acidosis, and, and the declining mental status.